I'm here with Dr. Peter Williams, who is the principal and CEO of Tyndale House in Cambridge and the author of this new book, Can We Trust the Gospels? Thank you for being here. Good to be with you. So, Peter, why did you write this book? Well, I've been thinking for a number of years that there wasn't a small book that someone could give to someone who just is at the point of trying to work out um, is there historical evidence for um, Jesus and the Gospels who doesn't have any background knowledge? I wanted to write for that sort of person. Now, you can write a book for that sort of person that can benefit all sorts of other people who have uh, maybe been Christians for a long time and so on. But I thought of someone who knows nothing about the Gospels but is still asking this question, can we trust the Gospels? That's absolutely essential uh, if you're going to ask questions about Jesus. So uh, that's why I did it. Mm. So what are some of the defining characteristics of the four Gospels? The four Gospels are the four best sources we have uh, for Jesus's life. Uh, and they are very focused on uh, him. Typically, they are spending a significant amount of their space focusing, in fact, on the week of his um, uh, death and uh, the passion, the resurrection. Um, and they all contain uh, teaching. There are you know, three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, which are closer to each other uh, in terms of content uh, than they are to John. And as is typical of other books in the Bible, they have a wonderfully high view of God. And also at the same time, they are not doing propaganda for any humans. Uh, you know, they're not um, the only you know, human who is perfect is, is Jesus Christ. The other thing is that the all four Gospels are stunningly Jewish. They are extremely connected with the Old Testament, um, just quoting it all the time. I mean, uh, you, you have allusion to the Old Testament within the first verses of three of the four Gospels. And in the case of, of Luke, by the time you're at the fifth verse, you're in this scene so much like First Samuel uh, the, uh, fr from the Old Testament. And again, um, this just goes thickly right the way through uh, the Gospels. So they're not the sorts of things that would have been made up uh, a long time later when uh, Christianity was more separate from Judaism and wasn't taking such a great interest in the Old Testament. Mm. You mentioned the authors there. How, why can we be confident in the authorship of the Gospels? So with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, there's a unanimous um, testimony to these um, four people being uh, the authors. And you can see that in the running headers of Gospels. So if you take a fourth century manuscript like Codex Vaticanus or Codex Sinaiticus, you'll see across the top um, Matthew on Matthew's Gospel, Mark on marks and so on um, and that goes back before then as far as we can get the top margins of manuscripts so let's say um, by the year 200 but we can go a bit further back than that uh, to someone like Irenaeus the uh, church father who uh, was in Lyon in France who around the year 185 is confirming uh, these as authors but I think you can go yet further back um, on, on that. But we can also have another look at it and say, look, if you had Mark and Luke, other than through their Gospels, they are not famous people at all. I mean, there's, there's nothing much on their CV other than having written the right. Gospels. Um, and so what reason would anyone have to attribute the Gospels to them? Because neither of them are actually amongst the 12 apostles. So I think that you can make very good case for um, those two, there being no motive for anyone to put another name on them. In the case of Matthew um, and John, these are of the 12 disciples, but we can look at Matthew's gospel. We can say clearly on its knowledge basis, it has to be written by someone who knows an awful lot about um, uh, Judea and Galilee. It has to be written by someone who knows quite a lot about finance. Actually has quite a lot of interest in finance. There are more mentions of money uh, in Matthew's Gospel than there are uh, in um, any other uh, Gospel, which is what you'd expect from a tax collector. In the case of John, 
I think it's better attested than I can think of any classical work because you have Irenaeus, who was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John himself, quoting from John's gospel and saying this was written by uh, John. And what people don't realize is that's really very unusual to have that sort of attestation um, in the ancient world. Typically, when we say a particular work is by Plato or by Aristotle or something like that, it's because uh, there's some list in a late manuscript where someone says um, Aristotle or Plato wrote all these works and there's a completely separate manuscript where it says at the top, this is the work and we put these together and, 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 and say, well, this is by Plato or Aristotle, but it's not that you actually have the work quoted uh, so that you're, you're absolutely 100% certain it's the same book. So um, all of these are you know, good grounds for um, saying the uh, Gospels are by these four authors. And you can put a few more layers on. For instance, um, people start having apocryphal Gospels after a little while. And you know, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, and so on. And no one ever uses the names Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because they've already been taken, in a sense. Uh, you couldn't make up a, a new uh, Gospel. You can make up the Gospel of Philip, you make up the Gospel of Peter but you can't do Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because the names have already been taken. So I think, again, this just fits the pattern. Interesting. In the book, you give all sorts of often quite small details mm -hmm. that help demonstrate the authenticity of the Gospels. Could you share some of those with us? Yes, yeah, so I mean, I just give a selection of a, a few of many uh, that you could look at within the Gospels. So for instance, uh, in Matthew's Gospel, uh, you have uh, a point where he uh, calls out woes on Chorazin and on Capernaum and on Bethsaida. And these are three places which are incredibly close together. And what we realize is whoever writes this has to know uh, that these places are close together. Either Jesus actually said those words and they were simply recorded and that's why um, it fits or you have to have someone who does a lot of investigation and uh, therefore you um, has known the geography but it's really interesting because you look at the gospels and consistently what you're getting mentioned is places around the northern shore of, of the sea of galilee uh, and these aren't easy places to look up you're, you're, you're finding you know mary magdalene so she comes from magdala's on the northern shore uh, it mentions um uh, Genesar, uh, it mentions um uh, the, the, well, Gennesaret, it mentions uh, the um, Capernaum, Bethsaida. These are all sorts of places which you can locate. Um, and, and so this is the sort of pattern you get when you've got local knowledge. You can also, um, as one little detail I, I give in the book where you have, um, say, in Matthew's Gospel, where Jesus is praying in the garden, let this cup pass from me, meaning the cup of uh, I mean, at a minimal reading, suffering, but I think correctly of, of God's uh, anger against sin, um, let this pass from me. And then you go across to John's gospel and he doesn't directly record those words at all. But when they come to arrest Jesus um, and his disciple Peter tries to intervene and, and stop this, um, Jesus says, shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? And this is um, hard to explain such an odd phrase and yet, if you look at the, what you have in the other gospel, you realize that it, it, one explains the other. He had cup on his mind. It makes sense. Hmm. And how do the details of the apocryphal gospels compare with those canonical gospels? Well, really not very well at all. I mean, there isn't a you know, united body of apocryphal gospels. It's worth recognizing that the Gospel of Thomas, for instance, is a standalone gospel. It says it is the only true gospel. You know, it says, um, these are the secret sayings which the living Jesus spoke and which Didymus Judas Thomas wrote down. In other words, um, you know, this is the only true story. There are, there may be four public gospels or other public gospels, but they don't let you into the real deal. And that's exactly what the Gospel of Judas does. Again, begins, these are the secret sayings. And that means you can't, with these gospels, put them alongside the others because they explicitly say that they are the only one which tells the truth. Um, so, when you look at, say, the Gospel of Thomas, 
it's this living Jesus spoke. And you wonder, where on earth is he? Is he in Galilee? Is he in Judea? Is he in heaven? Uh, you actually have no clue. Uh, it doesn't have um, narrative. It doesn't have, you know, geographical movement. You couldn't say that, there, you know, there's a knowledge that there's a Sea of Galilee or anything like that. You just don't have that uh, there. The best one for any geographical knowledge is the Gospel of Peter. And that, I think, is slightly better at geography because it copies the four Gospels. Uh, but, you yeah, know, in terms of their own raw knowledge, it's almost nothing. I mean, just in terms of towns, um, they either mention Jerusalem or almost nowhere else you get mentioned. Occasionally Samaria, Nazareth, but not much. You mentioned the word propaganda mm -hmm. earlier. Are the Gospels a sort of propaganda? Well, the, the Gospels are certainly very positive about Jesus. They're, they're, they're commending him uh, to people, but what they're not doing is uh, twisting the facts to do that. They're giving you a very uh, straightforward uh, reading. And, and one of the things you can see about that is, say, Matthew and Mark having um, Jesus's dereliction cry from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, this is this is not what a PR firm would do. They want to gloss over this sort of thing. Um, this is not what some propagandist for Stalin uh, w w would allow to creep. You, you don't allow these sorts of things to, to come through uh, when you're trying normally to um, persuade people, you know, uh, to uh, ac ac accept someone. And yet we do have this in the Gospels. And I think that's a, um, one of many of the signs that they have of truthfulness. Hmm. How can we corroborate the Gospels with non-Christian sources? Well, I think there's always going to be a limit to how much you can do this. So, for instance, one of the main sources we have for um, the time of the New Testament is Josephus, who's writing slightly later in the first century. And he's got his annals, uh, or no, sorry, his antiquities, and they, they you know, will go uh, through what happened. But if you look at his uh, books, the antiquities, in the relevant sections, he only has about 500 words per year to cover. So some people sort of talk as if there are loads and loads of sources. No, there aren't lots of writers that survive uh, from Judea, Palestine, you know, at, at, this, at this stage. Um, so the New Testament is 138,000 words long. The Dead Sea Scrolls in entirety are just over 500,000 words long. And that includes many bits that are just Bible, Old Testament. So in fact, um, if we look at all of the sources there are, the New Testament is, is quite a significant proportion. Uh, so I think that's where we need to uh, bear in mind that, um, you know, uh, we can't expect lots and lots of sources to be um, corroborating uh, everything as if they were, you know, we had the Palestine Daily News there. But what you can say is we can test the, the gospel writers' knowledge of things. We can test their knowledge of geography, of culture. We've got the later written down Jewish laws. We've got the later written down um, uh, Jewish stories, the Midrash. Um, and you can start seeing that there's lots and lots of um, evidence that the sort of things that Jesus was discussing, say when it's about divorce or about cleanness or about tithing mint, these are exactly the sorts of discussions that were going on um, in the land at the time. Uh, we can say the social stratification works, and also even with Jesus' parables, that they have symbolism uh, which is found elsewhere in, in rabbinic parables, although he um, uses the genre far more a, a parable, far more, and um, you know, does his own thing with it. So it's not in any sense that it's derivative and, and you know, not original, it's highly original, but it's, it's still, there's enough for you to be confident that it's, it's from uh, the right cultural milieu. How about manuscript evidence? Can manuscript evidence help show the reliability of the Gospels? Well, um, manuscript evidence can um, go a long way to showing, you know, how things have been carefully copied over time. I mean, one of the great things about manuscripts is you don't necessarily need a lot of them. Um, I mean, actually, you only need one good manuscript to be confident of what something said. Uh, and in the case of the Gospels, we have um, up to a couple of thousand of manuscripts. So, you know, the number for perhaps all of the New Testament would be five and a half thousand, but that's not 
equally distributed, um, say John would have some the most, and if you were to take them, and typically if you have manuscripts, they might be more likely to lose the beginning and end just because they, you know, those are the covers where, you know, covers of books get worn off sometimes before the inner pages. So if you were to take a middle chapter of John, you might have 2,000 manuscripts which survive of, of, of that. Um, but certainly, you know, we're, we're talking about very large numbers and we've got manuscripts of the four gospels complete in the fourth century and substantial uh, parts in the third, you know, some parts even of John's gospel in the second century. So um, this is, um, I suppose it's a bit like a, an auditor doesn't need to check every record in a company. They just need to check, select records and see whether there are any problems. And so in the same way with the um, very earliest fragments of the New Testament, they are a bit like an audit uh, trail. They agree with the later ones and therefore you can uh, take a very reasonable assumption that uh, the whole text has been unchanged. So what are the, some of the common claims for rejecting the reliability of the Gospels? So, I mean, people uh, can raise all sorts of uh, questions. I mean, some people uh, don't like the idea of miracles and they might say, look, even if miracles occurred, we don't know that it would be rational for us to believe that they occurred because after all, this is on the basis of very distant testimony from us and they would say we don't believe don't see miracles happen today so why should we believe miracles and surely sometimes people say any explanation is preferable to a miracle so you know the Sherlock Holmes saying once you've excluded the the impossible whatever's left however improbable must be the truth and to this I, I would say look what people often do is they're predefining the parameters of, of, of what can be uh, believed and we're not asking people to believe in random miracles that are just disturbances of, um, of, of normality. We're not asking people to believe in the paranormal. We're actually asking people to believe in miracles which together with surrounding messages form a pattern. So we're actually asking people to recognize a signal. It's signal recognition, uh, which is very different from uh, something uh, random that's noise. It's not noise, it's signal. So that's where uh, to, to see miracles as that, it's not that we're just asking people um, you know, to believe in completely random things. They form a pattern, particularly around Jesus, to authenticate who he is and what he can do. I wonder if some of the problem also is in people wanting proof and misunderstanding that. How do you think people yeah. misunderstand proof today? So I think the word proof, you know, is one of those things that can be used in mathematics and formal logic, where essentially you define the premises or axioms, you work through and out pops the, the, the result. Then you have a different use of the word in a court of law, where, you know, you're, you're talking about, you know, things that might be beyond reasonable doubt or the balance of probabilities and preponderance of evidence. These are what can be used. But actually, it's not a very useful word nowadays because people are often looking for some sort of mathematical proof of God. And, and you have to push back and say, look, I can't give you a mathematical proof of all sorts of things. I can't prove anyone loves you using maths. I can't prove that terrorism is wrong using maths. <laughs> you know, it, it, that, that, that's not what we're gonna get out of it, but I, I do think you know, terrorism is absolutely wrong, and uh, we've got compelling arguments that it's wrong. Um, but often people are looking for the wrong sort of thing. So um, when Christians are talking about uh, trusting God and having grounds to trust God, having grounds to trust the Gospels, we're looking in the range of personal trust. We're looking at the evidence that we use to uh, assess persons constantly. And, you know, we... We eat most days and we, we eat because uh, and we trust the food providers, the people who sell us food or whoever it is, not to have poisoned us. And that's a we, we stake our whole life. You know, just one fork full of food is enough to kill you if it's been poisoned. You know, so this is where we're, we're, we're constantly staking our entire life on trusting other people. And what uh, I see Christianity is doing is inviting people to trust a person, a person of God 
and um, to use that um, ability uh, which we're exercising all of the time to discern what's trustworthy or not. So we're not actually asking people to do something they're not doing in an analogous way already. I mean, there is something very much beyond that when you're, 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 you're trusting Christ. But, but, but effectively, um, what they can't say is, I don't go into trusting people. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I actually know they are already they may not have ever expressed their criteria for this, but they have criteria for when they trust a person or not. And they are staking their life on that on a daily basis. Why can we be confident in the, in the actual words and wording of the Gospels? Well, I mean, what we can say is there's a remarkable um, uh, faithfulness in copying over time. I mean, scribes back then you know, uh, could do a good job. And Christianity spreads far and fast. So um, that means that you start not just having, say, the Gospels in, in Greek, which is what they're written in, but also they're then translated into Latin and Syriac and Coptic and later Anglo-Saxon, Armenian, Georgian, Arabic, and so on. Now, what that means is there's no pope, there's no monarch in history, in the history of the church, who's been a, in a position to change everyone's Gospels. It's just not um, logistically possible. They're not any, you know, not in a single person's jurisdiction. Um, and anyway, even if you want to change them in one language, that wouldn't change them in another language. So in fact, one of the things we can do is we can trace an awful lot of the, um, the history of the Gospels. It's almost like, um, you know, the, the big genome project, the human genome project, where you can trace large bits of data and how they relate and People use, you know, these ancestry DNA searches to work out how things relate to each other. You can do the same with manuscripts. There's large amounts of data. You know where they all are, and, and they um, they don't turn up in just one city. They're in different monasteries and museums, and and, and so on. You you feed in the data, and, and you can basically see that yes, of course, sometimes people miscopy things over time, uh, but you're able to trace when those uh, mistakes come in, and, and and that enables you to have um, a lot of confidence. Another way of looking at it is this. Uh, I've been involved at Tinder House in producing uh, a Greek New Testament with my uh, colleague Dirk Jonkin, who did most of the work. And uh, actually, the Greek text that we produced is not very different from what other scholars have produced, or other scholars even say that they would produce. I mean, uh, even um, you know the skeptic Bart Ehrman is on record as saying that if he were to edit the Greek New Testament, it would not be very different uh, from you know, standard editions. And so it's worth bearing that in mind. You know, it, it's, it's, it's not that there is a large degree of um, you know, uncertainty about the text. Reading the book, it seems to be, seems to be the work of years, decades of your study, which you've condensed so that we can read it easily. So this may be a hard question to answer, but what are some of the things you learned? What are some of the surprises in putting the book together? Yes, I mean, I, I did think about it for 20 years. I mean, I actually started probably planning that book 21 years before I wrote it. Uh, um, uh, and I'll never do that again for another book. Uh, and also, as my daughter commented to me, uh, Dad, this is just, you know, all your talks put together and, and it, you know, to some extent it was. What I was surprised about in one sense is how easy it was to write the book when I got down to it. Um, and a very encouraging thing for me as someone commending the truth of the Gospels to people, that I didn't feel I was having to wrestle the data into shape and, and wrestle the arguments into shape as if they wouldn't fit and I was just trying to squeeze the data in. No, actually things fitted very easily. The, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, there's plenty more I, I, I could have put in there. The, date, the data came fairly easily. Um, and, you know, that, that was the encouraging thing. I think the other thing I was um, perhaps recognizing more only in recent years is how the Gospels have these arguments on their surface. That is, everyone it doesn't necessarily have to have, have, have studied a lot, can see the stuff there. I mean, particularly with the, um, just the, the geographical knowledge, um, and, uh, but, but many other things like that, where you can say, you, you, you pick up a story 
And let's say you have the triumphal entry into Jerusalem where Jesus rides, uh, you know, is reported to ride, you know, down the Mount of Olives um, on a donkey. They're singing, you know, Hosanna to the son of David or shouting Hosanna to the son of David. And in, in, in John, they're using palm branches. All of those have a huge number of claims. You know, everything from the likelihood that someone says Hosanna around the time of Passover coming into Jerusalem, which actually you can verify is a pretty plausible thing, including the very shape of Hosanna. Palms, yes, are local. There being a hill, yes. You know, so you get all of these things coming together. Uh, and yes, people used to say Psalm 118 um, at, at this time of Passover. So all of these things come and, and you think, it would be rather difficult for someone just to make this up. Um, either they've been very close to the culture and they have reported this sort of stuff, or, or, or they would have to have done a tremendous amount of research. And that's all very well to claim that as a one-off for that passage, but it's the fact that you could do it on almost any passage. Um, uh, you know, I, um, I hope um, in the next few months to be able to set, it, set myself the the challenge of finding, um, uh, being able to document that I can find these sorts of things in every passage. So a actually look at every little section and uh, have some such things. That will be fun. I expect to, you know, this, I expect that's how it will fall out. That will be fun. What sort of reaction have you got to the book from well, both from from believers and unbelievers? So um, from believers, you know, uh, people very encouraged, um, you know, uh, it's, it's going to be translated into various languages, you know, Romanian, Hungarian, French, German, Norwegian, uh, and other ones, uh, hopefully over time. Um, from unbelievers, I mean, they've, uh, people have been very polite, actually, uh, and um, said they, 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 they found it well argued, you know, I'd love to get more feedback uh, from uh, people who aren't yet convinced. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's certainly with them in mind that I've been writing it. Thank you so much for writing it. I think it's a real service to the church that you've done it for us. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for chatting it through with us. Thank you.